The Association of the United States Army is pleased to welcome you to AUSA's Thought Leaders webinar series, a webinar series featuring military leaders and contemporary military authors. Kicking off today's webinar is AUSA's President and Chief Executive Officer, General Carter Hamm. Good afternoon and welcome to the Association of the United States Army's Thought Leaders webinar. We're really glad that you, you've joined us today. And though we wish we could all be in person together for these kind of events, that's just not possible these days, though we hope they will be soon. But in, in spite of being, not being able to be in person, we're happy to bring you this webinar uh, to bring you a series of discussions with senior Army leaders, authors, and other personalities speaking on topics of current interest to America's Army. We're really, really glad that you've joined us today and very much appreciate your support of AUSA and your continuing support for America's Army. A special shout out to those joining us today who have had the privilege of serving with today's speaker. And I know many of you have had that opportunity and we look forward to reconnecting with him at least virtually during this webinar. And a special welcome also to two former Chiefs of Staff of the Army, General Dennis Reimer and General Pete Schoomaker. Thank you both for your leadership over many years and thanks for joining us today. So joining us today for thought leaders uh, to discuss his new book is General George Jow, when the United States Army retired, author of Watchmen at the Gates, A Soldier's Journey from Berlin to Bosnia. General Jowan retired from the Army in 1997 after serving as a commander of the United States Europe, European Command and concurrently as Supreme Allied Commander Europe. He is one of a very few senior leaders who commanded two combatant commands, having commanded U.S. Southern Command prior to becoming SACUR. His career spanned 36 years and included multiple combat tours in Vietnam, as well as service in the Pentagon and at the White House. He gained uh, teaching experience at both the United States Military Academy and at Loyola University of Chicago. You can uh, see General Jowan's full biography at the handouts tab on your on your screen to read, read more about this distinguished soldier. Uh, the title of the book is uh, really interesting uh, to, to me, Watchmen at the Gates, a copy of which you can buy, by the way, on, online. We hope that you will. Uh, and for those of you who know General Jowan and those of you who will read the book, uh, one of the themes is he was in Europe, in Germany, when the Berlin Wall was built, and he was in Germany, uh, in Europe when the Berlin Wall fell. So that kind of gives you a, a snapshot of the, the breadth of, of his service. Now, today, we'll, uh, General Jowan will talk with us a bit about his book, and then we'll have a conversation and look forward to your questions. So to post your question, go to the, on the right-hand side of your screen. There's a little tab there, and it says, Ask a Question. And we look forward to your questions from, from the audience. But for now, uh, please welcome uh, to, the, uh, to the lectern, uh, today's guest and the author of today's book, Watchmen at the Gates, a general retired George Jowan. General Jowan, sir, thank you. I'm delighted to be here. And uh, let me start by saying uh, there are 36 years of experience in this book. And the key part of all of that is that those of you that I was privileged to serve with, uh, I must say, are the reason if we had any success uh, it was because of you. And I dedicated the book, if you open it up, the dedication is to the troops. And the troops are what, what really I came away with after 36 years of the privilege I had to command the, the great young men and women of, of this country. So, uh, the overview, which I'd like to like to get to your questions, well, let me just give a short overview if I can. Uh, I talk a little bit about what uh, my hometown in Pennsylvania I meant there. My grandfather was a uh, was a immigrant who came in the 1880s and settled in the town of Pottsville, best noted by the army for yingling beer, and they. they uh, it's a great town, and they have a, a society there, the uh, historical society, and I gave them a lot of my memorabilia when I retired. 
but there's 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 great uh, uh, military roots in that town and in the county in the Revolutionary War in in the Civil War in particular, and they have a great Civil War monument in the middle of the town. So I grew up in that environment, and I I, I think. Uh, uh, what was important for me is when my grandfather was passing away at the age of 93, I was at West Point at the time, and he asked to see me. So I guess I think I was a, a yearling or, or, or a junior. And I went down to see him, and I went into his room, and he said, I'm very proud that a grandson of mine is going to serve in the army of this country. This country has given so much opportunity for our family, and there's none of the like it in the world. So he said, I'm proud of you. The next day he passed away. But that's America. That really all that was in the county I grew up in were Lithuanians, were, were Russians, were uh, all kinds of different ethnic groups that the, the coal rush brought into the region. So I mentioned some of that, and it has a great football history. They won the title of the first NFL Super Bowl back in 1925. Little Pottsville had a team called the Maroons, and, and they actually beat Chicago for the NFL championship in 1925. Then the four horsemen from Notre Dame challenged them to a game, uh, you know, the college team but one of the best in the country. And they played him in, in, uh, in Florida and beat him. But the Florida owner, just like owners today, said, that's, that's our territory. We should have played them. And so they forfeited the game and forfeited the title, so the legend goes. But anyhow, it's a, it, it, it's a great, uh, great legend and a great, great moment for, for the city. And I, that's, in, that's in the book. But the other part of it is, how do you operate in the current environment when you have to really understand not only the military situation, but when you get the four stars, you get a lot into the political side of it. And how do you create what I call the best conditions for success in whatever the operation is? It's not just overwhelming power. It's the best conditions for success. And if you look at some of the recent stuff, and I'm not going to get into Iraq, but when you talk about uh, clarity of mission, when you talk about unity of command, robust rules of engagement, and timely political decisions, the most difficult of that is timely political decisions. Because that way you can train the mission, and, you get, and that's always late in coming particularly when it's, it's uh, not at the high end of the spectrum, at the lower end of the spectrum. But this talks about how you do that. And how do you really look at all the elements of our power, which uh, not just military, but political, diplomatic, economic, all those are elements of power. And I always felt you need to understand that when you go in to whatever level you're at, but particularly as you get to be a senior commander. And I, I did that, and it was uh, very useful as we went into in Germany of trying to figure out how to really uh, get a way to get the Russians to understand what we're about. And I mentioned in here my conversations with uh, General Grachov, who was the Minister of Defense of Russia, four-star general. And uh, he got me aside and mentioned, he says, I know all about you. I know all about your unit. I was planning, I had command fifth corps when he was the commander in the Baltics that was gonna come over the Rhine River, get the bridges, and the first guards tank army was gonna join up. Our job was not let that happen. And he watched our, we maneuvered on these BCTPs that we ran, the exercises we ran, our tank gunnery. I had something called spearhead shock. We would pull a, 
unit out immediately and send them to the range in Grafenvir and grade them, can they? So that makes home station training important. And uh, it was the highlight of one of my lives when uh, they, they would go up there, the helicopters come in, the HETs would take their our, our, uh, tanks up there, get on range eight, they marry up with it. No, you, where, you are in, where, where you are in your training is what you shoot. And uh, it was amazing. It was amazing. And, and, and the troops, you know, I hate to tell you, they love that sort of stuff. They really do. They like to compete. And so that got us on, a, on what, what readiness is all about, what war fighting is all about, and how do we get ready to win day one of a war? And that was our, that was our mantra as we, we trained, and, within the, and that's in, in some of them in the book. When you get in other situations like... Uh, Latin America, and you, you know, I, I was in Germany most of my life, uh, in, in Europe. I get down there and we have a, a unbelievable, there's a drug war going on, there's all kinds of issues. So we, we talk about how can we organize to really try to say, cut down the flow of drugs coming into the United States. And we come up with a pretty good solution and that's in there. And uh, when, when I got back to, uh, to Europe, we, we, we were faced with Bosnia. And I said very, very quickly, what's the mission? And everybody sort of hems and haws. And so I, I finally got the clarity I need to be able to make a, make a diff uh, decision. And when I got those four things, particularly robust rules of engagement, Holbrook called me to uh, Dayton. We had Milosevic and his thugs there uh, going, trying to get the Dayton Peace Accords signed and wasn't that much, uh, much uh, success. So Secretary Perry and I, and I took Bill Nash with me because I wanted to see what we're gonna be up against and Milosevic there with, with all his thugs, and he came up to me, and I had met him before. He says, who are you? And I said, I'm the Supreme Commander of Europe. I'm in command of all U.S. forces in Europe. And I said, I have rules of engagement, because they were killing U.N. guys right and left. I have rules of engagement. If you point a weapon at any one of my troops, that soldier will shoot back and shoot back the kill and he doesn't have to go to Boutrous, Boutrous, Gali in the UN or me for permission, because that's what I have in the rules of engagement. Milosevic later said to Holbrook, who's this crazy guy that's in charge of NATO military forces? We didn't lose a soldier to a hostile fire in all the next couple of years. And so I only say that, that you have to fight for that. You have to fight, not just in the United States with our president and secretary of defense, but in an international area, it's even more so that you've got to get it uh, from the North Atlantic Council as, as well as Bosnia. Well, how much? <laughs> so I, think we're, I think we're getting some questions in. I think we're ready to go to questions. If okay. Let me stop there and what's on your mind. And again, for those of you that we've served together, I really appreciate what you did for me and what you did for your country. Okay. Good. Good. Sir, would you join me here, please? Oh, okay. I like that book. My daughter, I, she never, I, she's not seen, she just saw that book. She ordered one. She said, Dad, you're a badass. I said, really? So for the audience, <laughs> just, just so you know how how truly hot off the press this book is. Until he walked into this room, General Jawan had not seen the printed copy of, of, of this book. So it truly is hot off the press and, and you have an opportunity to, to purchase and we, we hope that you will. And again, for the audience, if you've got some questions, as we see some coming in now, uh, go to the, at the bottom right hand of your, of your screen where it says, ask a question, and we'll, we'll look to get to many of those. Uh, Sir, as the questions are coming in, I, I want to take you back, you know, as a young officer, you started in, 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 uh, in Germany uh, and in multiple tours in Vietnam. 
that army that you joined, the platoons that you first led, were vastly different from the army that you retired from in 1997. Talk a bit about that period of transformation that you and, and, and other senior leaders in the Army led the Army through in the, in the immediate post-Vietnam era, era that, that yielded a different Army. Well, if you remember the climate then within the Army, we had a lot of drug problems. We're just coming out of Vietnam. And uh, we, we had some racial problems as well in the Army at that time. And so what we had to do to come to grips with is, uh, you know, what are we about? And I think it's the leadership that provides that example. And uh, what we ended up doing was making sure that uh, you form teams. I talked about one team, one fight in the book. Uh, and this is something where you bring people together and you for form a team. And many of these teams are not just military. They're non-government organizations. There, there, there are other agencies that you need to get the job done. Uh, but the generation that, uh, when particularly I say in there, when we graduated from the War College in, uh, I think it was 78, uh, in that class, I think there were five four-star generals that graduated from that class. And that class was the the basis for what was going to happen, the transformation of the army. They brought their energy, they brought their wisdom, they brought their, their skills, and that transformed the army. We went from uh, a very difficult time in getting out of Vietnam and a country and an and and and, and, and army that was uh, not very good, drug-ridden, insubordination, et cetera. And I... I my second tour was in the 101st Airborne. And uh, so what I tried to do, what, uh, we went through this about getting ready to win uh, the first battle of the war. And the way we, we did that was uh, really understand how do we get our troops to understand their role. And we went through some things to do that. But it was it was a process, and uh, fortunately, we had some good senior leaders that supported that concept, and we got into all kinds of uh, training models that would help. They, uh, you know, the the idea of of, uh, of using miles, I guess it was called, as as a su support in training. Uh, so. I, I would say that uh, we, we, at least my contemporaries, we sort of picked the ball up and ran with it in what I call a, a new army that needs to be formed after uh, so many years in Vietnam. Well, the army that, 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 that you all led through that transformation certainly uh, was, was a pretty amazing army. I, I enlisted in 73, so kind of at the, the beginning of, of that process and to watch how the army transformed under your leadership was pretty spectacular. You, a, an issue that you mentioned in your opening comments and, and, and just, uh, just again talked about that I want to push a little bit on. You, you, you wrote in the book as you were concluding your, your service at Loyola University in Chicago and headed to the Staff College at Fort Leavenworth. And I'll, I'll just read the quote. Uh, I took with me the conviction that for a military undertaking to be successful, clarity of mission is a rock bottom necessity. I was also thinking that given the military's subordination to the political leadership, it was the job of the senior military to engage the political order at the highest level beforehand to ensure the clarity of the goals the nation's armed forces were expected to accomplish. You had some unique opportunities in your military career in high military command, but also uniquely uh, at the White House where you were immersed in the political aspect. So what led you to that conclusion and how are we doing today? Well, that's a very good question. I, I, I really think uh, I go back to those four conditions again and clarity of mission was the first one. And you have to fight for that. You, you cannot... 
and I could give some examples in the book, but you, you, what is it? One, what is the mission in Iraq today? What is it? I asked that question 20 years ago when we went into Iraq and Afghanistan. What is the mission? And can you get the forces allocated to really bring about success? We need, we, senior military leaders, need to be proactive. Uh, when, and you, particularly when you get to be a general officer, you need to have uh, the cojones to go in there and really understand. And I was fortunate. I, I uh, uh, when you get a chance, uh, I remember Clinton brought back the four stars or for the, the, the what we call now combatant commanders. Uh, about twice, two or three times a year, and we'd sit around the table and you had an opportunity to talk. And therefore, when he he pulled me, I didn't want to leave South Carolina. He pulled me and says, come on up here, I'm going to make Supreme Allied Commander of Europe. I said, sir, I'm just getting to the point. I think we got a dangerous situation on our southern flank. I would really like to stay here. And I said, oh, by the way, I don't like what's happening in Europe. You're withdrawing the force too fast. There are still 20,000 nuclear weapons in, in the former Soviet Union. You know, you, you are creating a, an issue that uh, it may not lead to success for, it, for, for us, to deter war, not just to fight war. And he said, well, I want you to go over there anyway. And he said, I'm coming over there. You give me your assessment. And this was October. I'm coming over in January. And I did. And I said, we need to have a floor of 100,000 troops, because in free fall, I had 350,000 when I was there as a, as a uh, Corps commander and, uh, and uh, Zach Ewer, and we started to withdraw too, much, too fast. And so he put the floor at 100,000. After I, and for eight years in his national security strategy, 100,000 troops in Europe. Now, you could plan now. Now you 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 knew what you had, and this before Afcom came along, because you, you had as you come, you had all of Africa as well as as Europe and parts of the Middle East. So the idea here is that you got to stand up and be counted on the tough issues, and you got to give clear military advice. And uh, if I could digress. In Bosnia, uh, I got a call from my good friend, Charlie Kasvili, who was the chairman. He says, there's no support for you here in Bosnia. They just killed 10,000 or what, eight to 10,000 Muslims uh, in Srebrenica. And uh, I, so I said to Charlie, what do we stand for? What, what is it that we, that we want? What, impression, what, what leadership do one provide to an alliance that on their very borders has, you know, 10 to 12,000 troops or civilians murdered. He said, no one supports you back here. He said, the president doesn't support you. Congress doesn't support you. The Pentagon doesn't support you. I said, how about you, Charlie? <laughs> he said, if you want to get the president to agree, you have to come back here and make your case. I said, I'll be back there tomorrow. I got in a plane and flew back, flew up back. And fortunately, I've been in the, as, as you said, General Ham. I've been in, I was in the White House, so I knew the White House. I knew the Oval Office. So I went in there, and there they were around it in a circle. You had Secretary of Defense, Secretary of State. You had Madeleine Albright from the UN. You had the vice, uh, the uh, vice chief, uh, vice vice president of the United States. You had Tony uh, or Sam Berger for NS. NSC, and there they all were, and they're like this, and I'm the stucky, and I had Colonel in my aid, and so I put this four conditions for success up there. And we went he, afterwards. He went around the room and asked, "What are your questions for General Jawan?" And uh, the only one that really was frost me off was uh, the Vice President. He said, how many how many troops are we going to lose? So I said, let me tell you something. You give me these conditions, and I will lim uh, limit the number of losses we take. But I need to have these conditions. And I fought for these rules of engagement. 
to the point when I did meet with Milosevic, I said, don't futz with me. And he didn't. And you get, and that's part of what you really need to do to deter war. And that's part of the, that's part of, but I ramble on. Let me go to, go to another question. So a, a, a great question, I think, uh, uh, related to some of your earlier comments from, from Hans, who asked about, could you expound a little bit on your, the mill-to-mill -mill relationships that you had uh, with your Russian counterparts in Bosnia and elsewhere? Yeah, and that's a good question. And I mean, I was just pondering this, and I don't know why we don't take advantage of it. This is the 25th anniversary of Russian involvement of a brigade in, in Bosnia. Those things, you gotta, that's a way to build some bridges here. And, and so uh, uh, when, when Gotroff, uh, how I got him to do it, I wrote on a napkin about what we're going to with P Partnership for Peace, the Combined Joint Task Force, and, and Manfred Werner, the Secretary General, said, you make it work. And so I, I had this thing I drew out for him. I said, you know, we could bring some peace and stability. It, this ethnic war, I told them, if, if you look at Eastern and Central Europe, and particularly the countries that were former in the former Soviet Union, I said, there's ethnic conflict all the way up there. Every country has this. If you don't, we don't stop it here, and you you can't stop this killing. Then it may spread right up to the to the to the gates of Moscow. And Glatchov liked that. He said, "All right." And so he gave me a brigade. He gave me a three-star general for name Shetsov, uh, and we started the. If I can digress for a minute on Shetsov. He came in with his little team. He had a big one, those big hats on that the Russians wear. And he stood in front of me. I said, sit down. You want a cup of coffee? He said, I give him a cup of coffee. I said, how do we, how do we create some trust and confidence between us? What, what do you need to see? What do I need to do to do that? Because we're going to have unity of command. I said, that's me. And I said, if you don't like that, please don't, don't get involved. Uh, but we're going to have unity of command. I learned that from Eisenhower in World War II. Unity of command is so important. And he looked at me. He said, okay. He said, uh, let me give you this three star. And so shuts off and I started to work. And he, I, he went to the Air Operations Center in, in, in uh, Italy, flying over Bosnia for the air cap. And he came back. I said, what do you want to see now? He said, how about your... Ace Rapid Reaction Corps up in, uh, in in Germany. So he went up. I didn't go with him. Then he, the third thing, he said, let me go to your headquarters in Stuttgart. I told the guys, I said, unless it's some top secret, open all the doors. Let them look around. Let them understand what we're about. And I said, that in itself is deterrence. And, and uh, he came back and he shook his head. He said, I've been misled for 30 years. He said, you're here to help. You're here to, to stop the killing in, in Bosnia. So it, it's, that's how you do it. And I, I think we are well equipped as a nation and we should be able to have our generals understand that, uh, that they go in there. It's just not how do you apply overwhelming force, but how do you create conditions for success? I wanted the first armor division because Mladic was the Serbian tank commander who was overrunning all these little villages and killing a hell of a lot of people. I went Bill Nash in the 1st Armored Division. I have bigger takes than you have. So, uh, and, and we rolled right into the villages and uh, Baptiste, what, what John Baptiste, John Baptiste, uh, John Baptiste brought in. I told Milosevic, if you want to be part of the solution, let me tell you what you need to do. I, uh, the, the, the runway in Tusla is frozen over. I need to land this quartering party and I have a colonel in charge and I want to use Belgrade's airfield. He looks at me. I said, if you want to be part of the, the, the solution. So he opened it up and I must have been 20 cameras, out, television cameras out there from around Europe watching John Batiste land with his quartering party. And I'll tell you, Ham, he, he lined up on the on the runway. I mean, 
right, dress right, dress. <laughs> Took report, respected troops. And Milosevic said, I'll provide guides for you through Serbia, through Bosnia, to your quartering party. That's a long-winded answer, but that's what we get trained to do. You can't just sit there and uh, you, know, you have to create the best conditions for defense and, and uh, for uh, for success. And uh, you have to understand, I don't want to lose a soldier. And uh, so, as you wrestled with that uh, the crisis in the in the Balkans, you also had to confront uh, genocide in Rwanda. Um, and can, you, can you talk a little bit about um, about how that transpired, what the issues were? There's been some recent reporting uh, about the, the French actions at the time and, and uh, President Kagame of, of Rwanda now has commented upon that. But talk a bit about Rwanda. Yeah, I, I mean, it was, I, you know, it's, you, you dread that, but you got to expect that as a four star, as, as a Supreme Allied Commander or UCOM Commander, I get this call, it was on a Wednesday. And it's from Charlie Kasfili again, my buddy. And he says, the president's going to give you an execute order and, and wants you to deploy to Rwanda, not, to, not, not just to stop the fighting, but to stop the dying. I mean, they were drinking, it turned out, water out of Lake Kivu, which was uh, cholera. And so I said, okay, Charlie, I'll put a group together. I'll, I said, when does he want me to deploy? He said, tomorrow. Ah. So, you know, I said, okay. I said, okay. I said, uh, so I, that night I put guys from UCOM led by a reserve Marine colonel to go to Goma. They flew down. I said, you call me directly. I was up at my headquarters at Shape. And so he, the reserve colonel called me and he said, so you got to do something. He said, we can't get through the, from the airport to the town because of the bodies. He said, you know, that they're dying. Thousands are dying. So I asked, I said, okay. So I asked Perry to come in from, he was visiting in the Middle East. I said, you can come in the, to, uh, to, to uh, Brussels. And he did, and I met him there. And we're on his plane, it's a great picture of him. He signed it for me. And I brought, I think it was Jack Nix, who was gonna be my one star, and ended up after that to be Schroeder, Dan Schroeder. Uh, and so I briefed them on the on the uh, on the plane about how I was organizing for Rwanda, and so I asked them a question, and this is part of the clarity. I said, uh, I said, Mr. Secretary, what is my mission? What's the clarity of the mission? You know, do do you want? Uh, are we, we going to have to go into the camps? Are we gonna, what what is the mission? And I said, or is it humanitarian to stop the cholera, et cetera? He said, stop the dying. So I saluted and we went, we went into that mode. Uh, There's a great uh, woman by the name of Madame Ogata, who is High Commissioner for Refugees. Uh, she and I became buddies. I said, I'm gonna give you two Air Force guys in mufti and civilian clothes. They will prioritize the lift because the, the recon party that I sent said it's cholera. It's the water that's causing the problem. So you don't want the, the, the airborne unit in Vincenza was all set to go. I kept them on the runway because I, I, I said, what I need is water. So they brought in a, a, a a uh, fire a fire engine from San Francisco flew all the way in, and the French were controlling the air for, airport at Goma. So we had to get that cleared. He circled a couple times and landed. But the uh, secretary then, a month or so later, he and I went to Rwanda, and great progress has been made. This fire engine 
was able to make clean water. And we had priority of lift went to water purification and uh, the Mufti guys, the air control guys were making sure that they were up in front of the line. And that's how you, again, create conditions for success. So Perry lands and uh, we're walking, we and I are walking, uh, looking at all these tubes, all these tubes, they're all hooked together. Somehow the ingenuity of the Americans kludged all these things together and the, stopping the dying. So I put the major that was there in charge for the U.S. with Perry, and I walked with, I called him, uh, what, what was that, what's the guy called? Uh, Red Adair was the, the was, was a guy in the, yeah. he had overalls, he had blue overalls on. And I put my arm around him, walking over these, all these water uh, hoses. And I said, uh, I said, how, how the hell did you do this? He said, uh, General, he said, he said, me and the major worked it out. He said, we're Americans, and we know how to get things done. That's a pretty good, pretty good approach. We've, we've got uh, maybe maybe 10 minutes left, and so I'm going to kludge together a couple of different questions yeah. that, that have come in. I talk too much. Let me uh, ask you first, sir, about uh, some, some uh, a series of NATO questions. Uh, one is... Uh, a con some have expressed concern that that NATO expanded too quickly after the uh, collapse of the Soviet Union. You talked about in your discussions with the Russians, hey, listen, Russia, the last thing you ought to worry about is your western border. We got that secure for you. So if you could talk a little bit about that. Um, also related to NATO, uh, certainly a contemporary issue, Afghanistan is NATO's first out-of-sector mission. Proper role for NATO, in not proper role for NATO. Uh, how do you see things wrapping up there? And then, particularly current, is Russia's uh, build military buildup on the border of Ukraine. So, a bundle of NATO related questions. Yeah. Uh, let me let me let me say that I am I am for alliances, and I very strongly believe in NATO. But we must lead. The United States must lead. Without leadership, it doesn't work. Without American leadership, it doesn't work. So, uh, I forgot your question now. <laughs> so NATO expansion in yeah. the immediate period post Soviet Union collapse? Yeah, the, the, you know, I was at a dinner in London. Uh, and Primakov, who uh, I think he was the foreign minister, uh, was on my left, and he said, "Why are you expanding into into Eastern Europe? You are in Poland. You will have uh, that, that our nuclear sites will be within range." I said, uh, I, "I said, Mr. Secretary, that uh, we don't have to be." in Poland to bring your nuclear weapons in range. And I said, these are now democratic countries. They can make the decision whether they want to be partners in NATO or not. And I said, your threat is to the, uh, to, to the, to the West, which, uh, which, or to the East, which is uh, China and the Transcaucasus. Uh, and so, you know, I, I, I really think that uh, I don't know if I would have moved as fast in terms of the recognition. There was a lot of political pull to get a lot of these nations uh, to to support. And by the way, I, I had 35 nations join us in Bosnia. Many of most of them, all of the uh, former Warsaw Pact countries uh, were there, and. Uh, the the same goes with uh, uh, with how we trained, and uh, I mentioned the book we had. We we had exercises in all of the different countries. So uh, build the team, and the team I thought uh, by these countries, 
and, and I can win the you know, anecdotes of uh, how the app was received. Uh, but but I but I really think you have to do you know I hate to say Met T but uh, Met T works. And how do you create troops available? How do you get the clarity in terms of the mission? Uh, and the the, the 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 NATO nations have shed blood with us in Af in Afghanistan, in Iraq, in Syria, and so you gotta. You got to factor all that in. That uh, uh, they declared an Article Five right after the September 11th uh, plane that flew in the, the New York buildings. They declared an Article First time in NATO's history in support of the United States, uh, and and so that's the kind of allies we have. But you you have to always don't speak down to them. Include them in the conversation. And uh, I was always willing to do that. You you know the Russians as as well as anybody. Any comment uh, in the couple of minutes that we have about the the reported buildup on the border with Ukraine? Uh, I, I know I'm getting old. When my aide was the UCR commander Ben Hodges, and he'd have me over there and for all his conferences, and I he would talk about that, and I said you know. You got to show strength, and so I think I don't know if they put the brigade in the polling yet or not. Or they're going to put a U.S. brigade in. Yeah, uh, Fifth Corps uh, forward headquarters is there, and rotational uh, uh, forces are present. And and so I I think you have to show deterrence in a way that uh, the United States has got to be able to make that commitment. We are the leaders of the alliance. Without that leadership. Nothing gets done. Sir, so I'm going to, uh, uh, one of the first questions came in, I saved for the last question, and it's from, from uh, Peter M., who says uh, that he had the opportunity to, to serve as a tank company commander in the 11th Cavalry Regiment. Um, and he said, historians often talk about soldiers' physical courage, but don't dwell so much on moral courage. And so Peter asks, what was the most difficult decision you ever had to make from a moral standpoint? It's a tough question. Tough question. And there, it, I come back, there's one that occurred in Europe, one that occurred in Southcom when, you know, I, I got there in my first 10 days, there were three coups, an insurrection, and a war. And one of the wars was in El Salvador. So we, we, to make a long story short, we really tried to beef up the El Salvadorans. Uh, they ended up getting a, uh, there was a peace, a peace agreement, I think it was in 1991. And then President Cristiani called me into his office. I was there on a visit. He said, if the, if the uh, peace agreement is going to work, the Truth Commission on the killing of the priests and the nuns, the entire Estado Mayor must resign. That's the entire general staff. I said, they just won the war for you. So you talk about a tough decision. He said, without that, we're not going to get a peace agreement. So I put Ponce, who was their Minister of Defense, I guess, and we flew back to Panama and we talked on the way and uh, I told him, you won the war, now you have to win the peace. And if you love your country, then you have to do what is necessary to win the peace. He went back, he went and testified, the entire Estado Mayor resigned, and the peace treaty was signed. And I uh, hate to admit it, but 10 years later, the president, because I said the FMLN can become a political party, Ten years later, the president of El Salvador is an F, was a former FMLN guerrilla. So that was a tough one. But it worked. It worked. And, uh, but it takes constant, constant tending uh, by our leaders. And military leaders are highly respected in Latin America. Highly respected. And so uh, you have to set that example. And I set the example in Chile. 
when I went there for my visit and they wanted me to meet with Pinochet, I said, no, I'll meet with your president first, then I'll meet with your secretary of defense, then I'll meet with Pinochet. Pinochet kept me waiting for 30 minutes and I, I walked away. But those are decisions you gotta make. Okay. Good, well, thanks, sir. Yeah, thank, thanks very much for those insights. And again, for the audience, thanks for your great questions. I'm sorry we, we couldn't get to all, we could spend a couple of hours uh, here having that conversation. So we can't do that today, but what you can do is buy the book and read the book, <laughs> all right? So we encourage you to do that. It's full of uh, great insight, insights uh, over the career of a, of a great soldier and a great leader. And so I encourage you to do that. Uh, it not only is, is uh, a wonderful read from a historic perspective, uh, but the insights gained from General Jawan's observations and service, I think, serve uh, contemporary leaders quite well uh, today. So, sir, thank you uh, very much for, for being here today. Thank you for offering your book, Watchmen at the Gates, A Soldier's Journey from Berlin to Bosnia. Um, I was struck uh, by the last page of your, your book, uh, and... And it, it just speaks to, to who you are. And so I'm going to quote yourself back to you. You did your duty. You served your country with great distinction. Thank you. Thank you for being here today. Thank you even more for having served this great army in this great nation. Thank you. And the troops. And the that troops. Too, that too deserves all the credit. And you commanders out there or what soon to be commanders, never forget that. And if you can deter a fight rather than fight one, deter it. Uh, hate to lose soldiers. Okay. So, so if I can find my notes, uh, <laughs> I got the uh, some some information on a couple of of upcoming events for for everyone. Uh, um, on May fourth, we'll have a noon report with Lieutenant General Dan Carbler. Commanding General of the United States Army Space and Missile Defense Command. Uh, that'll be very, very interesting. Missile defense, obviously, a uh, hugely important topic and the growing importance of space. So 4 May with Lieutenant General Carbler. On 6 May, we have a special treat where we'll be joined by Lieutenant General Chris Tickell, who is the Deputy Chief of the British Army General Staff, and get a, a, some insights from, uh, from our closest ally and how the the British Army is proceeding these days. And on 3rd of June, uh, we'll have a very interesting webinar uh, with the Army Talent Management Task Force and a panel discussion about how the Army is addressing uh, talent management going forward. And uh, just to remember, in just 174 days, 174 days, the AUSA annual meeting, 11 through 13 October, we really look forward to seeing you at, at, the, at that great event. For information on any of those, just go to the AUSA website, ausa.org, uh, to register and get more, uh, more information on those. Finally, uh, for all of you who are AUSA members, thank you so very much for your membership. It is your membership that allows us to put on events like this. And if for some reason someone watching today is not an AUSA member, which I cannot really understand, uh, but if you if you aren't, and you, today is the day. Join AUSA. Go to AUSA.org. Join or renew your membership. We need it. It makes a difference each and every day and allows us to have great events like this with General Jowell. So, sir, again, thanks for all that you have done. Thanks for today. And for everybody, thanks for joining us. Have a great Army Day.